So, uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, welcome to our Sunday Bhagavatam class. It is uh, March 22nd, 2020, still in Coronado. So, uh, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So, um, of course, in addition to normal mortality, birth, death, old age, and disease, we now have this... Um, pandemic so i hope everyone is taking care of themselves doing all the right things which include of course very sincere <laughs> chanting of the holy name of krishna so we'll begin uh today we are going to read begin reading from uh, bhagavatam canto one chapter five text 33 And this is the verse. Amayo jascha bhutanam jayate jena subrata tariva hyam yang dravyam napunati chikitsitam. So, this is actually an ancient mention of the process of vaccination, as you will see. So, the verse begins Amayo. Amaya means disease <clears throat> or sickness. Simple Sanskrit word means disease or <clears throat> illness, sickness. <clears throat> so Amaya yascha bhutanam. And uh, so whatever disease there may be uh, of conditioned souls, living beings, bhutanam. I'll explain uh, the word bhuta. Bhuta is... Uh, comes from the Sanskrit word bhu, to be. So bhuta means someone that has come to be, and therefore it refers to our conditioned life, because as souls, as eternal souls, we don't come to be, we always exist. What does come to be, in other words, what becomes, is our conditioned life. The soul doing business as a material identity, a soul within a body, which is our current situation, uh, that is called a bhuta. In other words, something that has come to be a living being. Whereas the soul itself, of course, is eternal. So, amayo yascha bhuta nam. So, whatever disease, jayate, arises, which is also the Sanskrit word to take birth, so it also means like arises. Prabhupada translates it here as uh, become possible. So, Amayo Jascha Bhutanam Jayate Jena. It arises, a disease arises in living beings or for living beings, for their diseases arise. Uh, jena, by something, something causes it. And here, Narda addresses. Uh, <clears throat> Vyasa is subrata. Brata means a vow. If you take out the R, it's English. You know, vote uh, or voto in the Latin language is vrata. And su means good. So su vrata, Prabhupada translates, oh, good soul, literally means uh, one who has taken the right vows. For example, you, someone could take a vow to, uh, to, to offend at least five people every day. Some people actually, it seems like they do have vows like that. But anyway, so there are all kinds of vows. You can say, I vow that I will never rest until I've killed all my enemies, or until I vow that I will become the richest person. There's all kinds of vows, but they're not good vows necessarily. So here the word is suvrata, a good vow. For example, vowing to follow the four regular principles of, and, and of Krishna consciousness and vowing to chant Krishna's holy name a certain number of times, vowing to serve God. Those are excellent vows. So here, Narada addresses Vyasa as Subrata, 
want a, a good vow. So a disease arises for conditioned souls, a disease arises by some cause, and tadeva, hiyama yang dravya, and that very thing which caused the disease, that tadeva, which means that very thing, indeed he, literally amayam dravyam, the disease thing, that's what it actually says in Sanskrit, the disease thing, that very thing, or then they were talking about a material object, and then, and then the rhetorical question, napunati, doesn't it purify chikitsitam when uh, it's medicinally treated? Uh, chikitsita means like something medicinal. And so the dravyam, the very thing which caused the disease, when it is chikitsitam, sort of, you know, medicinally prepared, then the question, doesn't it actually purify? So this is like the idea of vaccination, which is right there in the Bhagavatam. So I don't know, maybe the anti-vaxxers, <laughs> I won't get into that controversy. So, so Narada is saying here, and this is a very important principle of Krishna consciousness. And that is, you don't have to uh, become a different person to be Krishna conscious. Of course, in some ways, we have to do some things differently. We accept certain moral principles and spiritual principles. Uh, we agree to practice spiritual life in certain ways. And of course, it's not all or nothing. You do the best you can. But still, uh, the idea here is, sure, we, have, we adopt certain spiritual practices and we avoid activities which are grossly sinful. But at the same time, it's still you. You still have to be yourself. And therefore, we were entangled in material life precisely because we were attracted to uh, the material world. We tried to enjoy or exploit the material world in certain ways. And, and therefore, that was the disease, the disease of material life. But when those, that, those same propensities, those same activities are dovetailed in Krishna consciousness, uh, then, by doing a, a similar activity for Krishna, uh, then the Bhagavatam Narada says, doesn't that purify? When you sort of medicalize, medicalize the very thing that was causing your disease. That's what Narada is saying here. So we'll go to the next verse and, and he'll explain more exactly what he means. He says, evam renang, Thus, Nrinang, for human beings, Kriya Yoga. And he uses the word Kriya Yoga in a special sense. Kriya Yoga can just be a, a yoga process. It means something like Karma Yoga, because the word Kriya is a synonym of Karma. It comes from the same root, action, activity, sort of action yoga, Karma Yoga. But here, Nara is using it in a different sense, which is clever. He's taking the word yoga to mean connection, so connection with fruit of activity. Kriya yoga, he's taking yoga as connection, not as spiritual process. So thus, uh, our, our material activities, sarve, all of them, sangsriti hetavaha, they're the causes of our material life. The word sangsriti in Sanskrit, in case you're following along, in the Sanskrit is just another way of saying samsara. It comes from the same root. It's just another way of saying samsara, samsriti. Hetava, the causes, plural of hetu. So te, te eva, those material activities alone, those very material activities, which are the causes of our material existence. So Narda, he spoke the previous verse using a, 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 uh, an analogy or metaphor of disease and how you can cure disease. Now he's in a sense giving a purport in verse 34, Nardamoni is giving a purport to his own previous statement. He said something and then he said, okay, this is what I meant. So evam renang kriya yoga sarve sangsati hitavaha teiva atma vina shaya kalpante kalpita pare. I'm sort of chuckling, I guess the technical word is here, because there's another 
unusual use, uh, another unusual use of a word, atma vinashaya, which literally would mean, in the most literal sense, for the destruction of the self, <laughs> which is obviously not what Narda means, because everywhere in his teaching, we're seeing that that's not what he means. So, atma, so what does it mean? Vinasha means loss or destruction. So, and atma of the atma, uh, and so the atma can also mean the we, the false ego, not in a technical philosophical sense, but the self that you are identifying with, the, the who you think you are right now. It's like, for example, commonly in English, if you say, I'll, I'll do it myself, or I want that for myself, you're not necessarily speaking about spiritual philosophy, about your eternal soul. You're just saying, uh, or even there's something called soul music, which is often about uh, people's deep material feelings. I mean, it's interesting. It's, it's sort of, there's an older gospel tradition from the African-American community, which was uh, explicitly religious about the real soul, but then uh, sort of, a, you, for, anyway, we'll go into the whole history of popular music, but then you get this um, soul music, which is usually about uh, people's attempts or failed attempts uh, to enjoy the material world. So, the word atma, atma vinashaya, for the loss of the soul, here means, of course, the, the, the material identity. And so it says that uh, all of these, all of these material activities, which are the causes of our, our material life, kalpante, they, be, they are able Literally, they are able, they become efficacious. They are able to uh, take us beyond our material identity to a spiritual understanding of ourself and everything else. Kalpita, when they are dedicated, pare, unto the Supreme. So in both these verses, 33 and 34, very inter interestingly, Narda is taking words and using them in unusual ways. And, and of course, it's very clear what he means from the context and everything else. But still, uh, so it's, it's a very interesting use of language in the Bhagavatam. Again, personally, I find the Bhagavatam, the, the, of course, Prabhupada uh, saved all of us with his presentation of the Bhagavatam. We wouldn't know anything. We would never have heard of the Bhagavatam. We'd have no idea what it means without reading Prabhupada's Bhagavatam. But uh, he also encourages us, Prabhupada put the Sanskrit there as an invitation to us to go deeply into the original text. And, and there's amazing things going on. So the word kalpita in Sanskrit can simply mean a performed for uh, or yeah, done for. And so, so that's what's going on here in this verse. Narda is saying that, uh, again, this paradox, which is an apparent contradiction, that you're doing certain activities. Let's say you like to play music and you do that for sense gratification or to attract the opposite sex or to get money or for whatever, just out of false ego because I want everyone to listen to me. And yet, if you do music for Krishna, that very same activity, you just change the motive, you change the intention, and that same activity that was binding you to this world liberates you. It's like, let's say, for example, you're driving your car in the wrong direction. You're getting farther and farther away from where you need to go. Just turn around and go in the opposite direction. That same car will take you to where you want to go. You don't need to get a different car. So our, our present, and of course, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 333, that um, Chaishtate swasya prakite jnana pi. Even someone that knows Krishna, even a, even a wise, learned person acts according to their own nature. We each have our own nature. You know, we can't try to pretend uh, to be someone else. We have our own nature. We have to be ourselves because if we if we are not ourselves, if we're not being authentic, 
then who are we purifying? It's almost like, let's say, for example, you want to wash your dishes and, or, or let's say you have a dishwasher. I actually never use them, but let's say you have a dishwasher and you turn it on and you have a lot of soap in there. You just forgot to put the dishes in. That's an example, the old dishwashing analogy, which I'm sure you've all heard. So in the same way, these devotional activities are purifying, but if you don't put your real self in the dishwasher, if you don't, if you don't put your real propensities, your real nature into devotional service, then what is being purified? Maybe the mind is being controlled for the moment, but you have to put, I mean, not, I mean, who you really are, of course, is an eternal soul. But at the same time, at the present time, we have this body, we each have a body, and so we have a certain material nature. And you've got to put who you really are into devotional service. And that's why Krishna says it's dangerous. He even says it's more dangerous than death, which is pretty dangerous. It's very dangerous to do another's duty. And Krishna says again and again in the Gita, your duty is born of your nature. So in a sense, even on a material level, you have to have some understanding of yourself to really perform bhakti yoga efficiently. You have to have a certain minimum amount of maturity and uh, self-understanding to really succeed at bhakti yoga. We can't just do certain activities because other people want us to do them uh, or because we think that we will impress other people or people will love us. We really have to see <clears throat> who am I in my present condition state and exactly what are the propensities that I need to purify by engaging them in devotional service. And of course, we don't mean uh, sort of horrible, sinful propensities, but your propensities, how you are inclined, for example, uh, ashram propensities. One has to have a realistic understanding of, of what you're capable of. I mean, everyone has uh, some material desires in there. It's a question of uh, where, which way are they tipping? It's like, you know, like which way is it going to go? If, can I, I have a desire. I mean, everyone has some, for example, attraction uh, or, or some to the opposite sex or some lust. But the question is, can I conquer this by devotional service or is it going to conquer me? Do I really need to engage it by, for example, well, not for example, really the only decent example of uh, getting married. I don't, there aren't really other great examples of how to deal with that. So um, so you have to have some idea, and, and, and that's why one has to be honest with oneself. We have to be honest with ourselves, but at the same time, not, um, not um, I mean, low self-esteem can also lead one to the wrong engagement in Krishna consciousness, not just pride or material desires, but for example, um, Anyway, there are many examples one can give. So, um, so getting back to the verse here. Uh, so those activities, which are sangsuti hetava, the causes, the reason we're in the material world, they're, they're the cause of our material life. Take those activities, the decent ones, or the ones that aren't like really disgusting and horrible. Take those activities and use them, transform them into devotional service. And then the real, the person you really are right now in your conditioned state, that person will go into the dishwasher and will get purified. That's the idea. So uh, do one more verse and maybe we'll look for some questions. So in this regard, atra means herein, in other words, in, in this regard, Jat uh, karma kriyate. I'm just sort of putting it in English word order. So whatever activities, whatever activity is performed, bhagavat paritoshanam, uh, to satisfy the Lord, to satisfy the Lord, so that I'm doing something and paritoshanam. Pari 
In Sanskrit, it means around, like English, peri, perimeter, perimeter. And so pari in Sanskrit, pari as a prefix can mean like completely, like, you know, all around, completely. So whatever is done to, to really satisfy Krishna, to really satisfy the Lord, whatever activity is done in that way, jnanam jatara dhinam hi bhakti yoga saman vitam. And uh, whatever knowledge is, is, is involved here, is relevant here, whatever knowledge is needed for your spiritual life, that literally is dependent. In other words, you get it at no extra cost. It's like do everything for Krishna, at no extra cost, you'll get spiritual understanding. So jnanam jatara dhinam hi bhakti yoga samanvitam. If that knowledge, if your understanding, your studies, your scholarship, your philosophy is uh, included in your bhakti yoga process, it becomes part of your bhakti yoga. Prabhupada translates this, whatever work is done here in this life for the satisfaction of the Lord's mission is called bhakti yoga or transcendental loving service to the Lord. And what is knowledge becomes a concomitant factor. So I'm going to look up concomitant here. It's not a word we use every day, but it is a good word. So it means naturally accompanying or associated. Here's the example. She loved travel with all its concomitant worries. <laughs> so it means something which naturally goes with something else, which naturally accompanies or is naturally associated with something else, concomitant. So if you are sincerely trying to satisfy Krishna, Bhagavat Paritoshana, you're sincerely trying to satisfy Krishna by your activities, then naturally there will be knowledge, there will be spiritual understanding. So you don't need to join two movements, like the Bhakti Yoga movement, ISKCON, and also a jnana movement. One movement will do it because bhakti yoga, even Krishna says in the Gita, shadhavan labate jnana, one who really trusts me, has really faith in this process, uh, labate jnana, achieves spiritual knowledge. So it's right there in the Gita. And in, in, in many ways, Krishna says, I'm in the heart, I'll give you knowledge and so on. So let me just take a look and see if there are any questions at this point. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. Here is a question. Uh, oh, that's just someone that's not really telling people to put question marks. That wasn't it. Okay, here's one. I know it's a somewhat awkward question. Is coronavirus divine, demonic, or blessing in disguise? Well, I don't really see a disguise here. If we accept that Krishna, oh, Hari Bol, an old friend I just saw there from Iowa. So um, if we understand that Krishna is not malicious or even indifferent, not only is Krishna not against us, he's neutral in one sense. Krishna says Samohang, I mean, he's neutral. He calls himself Udasina, but Asina, that I remain as if above everything. Like that's one way of saying detached, like just, you know, stay above it. Don't get, don't roll around in the mud on this issue. But Krishna also says that you have to understand me as Suradang Sarvabhutanam. I am the well wishing friend, the, the loving friend of. Uh, of all living beings. So Krishna says that, Suhradanya, and if you, you'll become peaceful if you understand me in that way. He's Bhoktaram Jagyatapasang, as the enjoyer of uh, sacrifices and austerity, Sarva Loka Maheshwaram, as the great Lord of all worlds. And Suhradam, literally Suhrit means good heart, hurt, hurt in Sanskrit is heart. So Suhradam Sarva Bhutanam, the good hearted friend of all living beings. Krishna says, Gyatva Mam. If you understand me in that way, then shanti mrichati, you achieve peace. And Krishna also says, 
that um that this whole world's going on under my direction. And so therefore, it's not that Krishna takes pleasure in spreading pandemics. And it's not that it's Krishna's idea. Krishna has created a fair and neutral, objective, cosmic system called karma. And uh, I mean, the amount of just raw exploitation going on now you know the, the the degree to which people in this world are just shamelessly you know really shamelessly and totally out of control exploiting the world without having the decency or the common sense to ask like who does it belong to basically we live on a planet full of shoplifters Everyone, you know, uh, not everyone, of course, are religious people also, but basically just trying to exploit the world in the most vulgar, gross, shameless ways. And so uh, the laws of karma, I mean, it's amazing. The laws of karma, the reactions people get, are both neutral and teleological or targeted. In other words, they have a purpose. They're neutral in the sense that everyone gets what they deserve. Krishna, it's not like the ancient Greek gods that Homer complained about where Zeus will say to his wife, Hera, Hera, see that Greek soldier down there at Troy? Uh, I'm going to blast him. I'm going to just totally mess him up. And Hera will say, well, why, Zeus? I mean, did he offend you? No, just don't like him. So this kind of partiality, Krishna insists in the Gita, I'm not favoring anyone. I don't hate anyone. You know, sometimes in our, you know, people not in their best moments will say, I just don't like that person. Well, why? I don't know. I just don't like them. Just think that person's disgusting. Well, why? I don't know. I just don't like them. Krishna is not like that. So on the one hand, you have this complete fairness. Everybody gets exactly what they deserve. On the other hand, even in giving people what they deserve, Krishna is kind of nudging them toward their own true self-interest. So, so the reactions you get in karma are fair, but they're designed to help you to achieve real happiness. So it's the best of both worlds. And therefore, as far as coronavirus, um, of course, people in an age of narcissism, it's very difficult for people to admit that we deserve this. They'll say, no, we don't deserve it. Like last I heard 24 priests in Italy also died. Of course, maybe they're getting a better life in the next life. But in an age of narcissism, which is the one we happen to live in, uh, people get angry. They're indignant by the idea that, you know, anyone deserves anything but the best. And, um, but in previous ages, especially if you look at history, I mean, things like Calvinism and other kind of strange forms of Protestantism, um, where this like uh, extreme guilt that in God's eyes, I am completely disgusting and horrible and sinful. And I just, so, I mean, these extremes are not really very helpful. I mean, and we see in history how people go to, you know, self-flagellation, whipping yourself, and, and so people go to extremes of self-loathing, self-hatred, and then narcissism of where you just worship yourself for no good reason, actually, not even for a good reason. So, uh, but if we're sort of in the middle and moderate, if we remember that we're not our bodies, if we, and, and so are these people actually dying? No, they're not. Uh, is it still, a, a, you know, an unfortunate tragic thing yes but are they actually dying no are they going to continue living yes and uh so personally we have to see that everything that krishna god does everything god does is ultimately for the best everything that god does is ultimately for the best and if someone may not believe that but literally that's their problem and if one is more advanced in spiritual life, one can actually see this. So uh, Ananda Leela is kindly sending me the questions actually all in one place on Facebook. So I'm going to see what other questions there are to get past all the uh, jokes that are going on now about quarantine and everything. So here's a question. In the purport of 1533, 
Prabhupada says, we should not try to lord it over the material nature, nor should we reject material things. Some devotees are propagating that gathering for kirtan in street Harinam or in other spaces is the salvation for COVID-19, therefore ignoring medical and government advice to practice social distancing. What is your opinion on this? I think it's not very intelligent. I mean, why not go out and do Harinam and keep a distance from the other people who are chanting? I mean, you don't have to be a mile away, but, you know, why not? I mean, actually, that would really, I mean, the funny thing is, that would really get a lot more positive attention. I mean, it would, that would be a newsworthy thing. Hey, even the Hare Krishnas are social distancing, but they're still chanting. I mean, obviously, it would be a much more interesting, attractive way to get people's attention. So, yeah, do Harinam and do social distances. distancing. How do we know, and, and, and don't be, I mean, to, that's probably really thought that was stupid. I mean, to, to be honest, that, that you just are reckless, you do something reckless and foolish, and then think Krishna has to come running and protect you. One time, I won't tell the whole story, Prabhupada was very, very anxious to, to send me to Bangladesh because we didn't have ISKCON in Bangladesh. That was the place where Lord Chaitanya's father was from. So many great uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas came from Gauradesh. And, and, and apparently some Hindu group was offering us a temple in Bangladesh. So Prabhupada was extremely anxious for me to go. I was going with my godbrother, uh, Subhag, who was a brahmacharya then. He's a sannyasian guru now. And, um, and yet when Prabhupada was advised by an old friend that no, it's too dangerous now in Bangladesh, there's some anti-Hindu sentiment, Prabhupada immediately forbid me to go. And I was sort of young and, and reckless. And so I said, it's okay, Prabhupada, we can go anyway. And Prabhupada said, no, you don't go. If there's danger, you don't go. So this idea that we ignore medical and government advice is just, it means someone uh, really needs to uh, screw their head on a little straighter. So how do we, with no offense intended, how do we know what our true nature is? And how do we communicate to temple authorities? That's a good one. If we feel that some service is not in our nature without being offensive. Uh, first of all, you know, as the old saying goes, know thyself, um, it requires some sincerity. Just like how did you know you should join the Hare Krishna movement? Hopefully because you were a little more serious than other people about understanding what the truth is. And so we have to be a little humble, we have to be sincere, and we have to maybe talk to other people and talk to our, you know, people that care about us and know us and just, because the way this comes up practically is that, uh, you know, that eternal problem for many devotees, what's my real nature? Or what should I really be doing for Krishna? And, uh, yeah, we have to uh, we have to be honest with ourselves and talk to other people we trust. We trust their intelligence and their and their friendship with us, and that's an important thing, especially nowadays. Because in previous ages, it wasn't a big problem because you had very few choices. In previous ages, when you had an agrarian economy and much more simple society, you had the varna system, and so it's like, okay, you got four choices. If you go into a store let's say to buy a shirt and there's only four shirts, it's not so hard. If you go into the store and there's like 400 shirts, someone may, you know, be there all day trying to figure out what shirt they want. So, but it does take sincerity and talk to people who can see perhaps some things about ourselves we, that we can't see. As far as temple authorities, uh, there are temple authorities, unfortunately, maybe I think there's still some who believe that to even have a nature means that you're not sincere, you're not surrendered, you're not supposed to have a nature. If you were really sincere about Krishna conscious, you would practice not having a nature and just do whatever is needed. Uh, what's interesting is that those, not just temple presidents, different leaders, those leaders usually uh, grant themselves the privilege of following their nature in many ways. But anyway, uh, the, the, sorry, I have a little cold here. Uh, the point is that, um, yeah, you can have an intelligent conversation. We can go too far with this, that's not my nature thing. We can become self-indulgent. We can become too specific. For example, I may say, uh, I want to sell books, but I only, only want to sell books in certain places where I like the weather, the scenery, and this and that. 
Or if you say, I want to sell the books to more educated people because that was Prabhupada's instruction to me, well, that may be a legitimate request. Or if you say, in other words, there has to be a balance where, because on one side, Krishna says, if you ignore your nature, basically it'll ruin your spiritual life. And so we should not allow people to tell us to ignore our natures. At the same time, you can get so much into your nature that you become self-indulgent, selfish, and just sort of lose the spirit of serving Krishna. So there has to be a balance between the two where you do something which is within your nature, but don't de define your nature too broadly. Like my nature is to be in a beautiful place uh, with these kinds, you know, or whatever, and, and to, and to, in other words, you can get so detailed about what you want to do that it, it's, it's not just a propensity, it becomes self, and it's not just what's my nature. When you talk about your nature, it's really in Varnashram, but there may be a few subcategories. It's not like every material desire we have is our nature. So we have to be honest in that way too. How do we know if it's our nature, not just, well, how do you like that? I think I just answered that. Okay, well, how do we know it? Uh, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be sincere. It's not like, Okay, I joined the Hare Krishna movement. That took a lot of sincerity or whatever it took. But you have to, we have to keep being sincere. We have to keep being self-critical. Uh, uh, ISKCON is not, uh, let's say, that's not its strong point, honest self-criticism. In fact, if you do sometimes criticize things, you're seen as offensive. Or, and, and, and it is possible to be offensive. But my experience has been that... Um, uh, we could use a little bit more looking in the mirror, a little more self-criticism. I think we could actually use that. And uh, if we did and, and took it, perhaps if I think if some leaders took a more honest look at where our movement really stands in relation to where Prabhupada wanted it to be, we might feel a need to make more adjustments. Oh, I skipped four. Very good. Very good. I have a very good assistant who... Uh, is in a lot of trouble now. Just kidding. That was a joke. How important is it to know Sanskrit seriously to be able to have a deeper understanding of the scriptures? Is this relevant? Uh, some people are just kind of uh, not into languages. And so it's not that everyone has to learn Sanskrit. Uh, everyone can do their own service. I would say if you can learn Sanskrit uh in a reasonable amount of time, if you have that sort of God-given ability, and you plan to use it seriously in devotional service, then why not? I mean, Yukta Vairagya. I found Sanskrit to be extremely helpful to me in my attempt to serve Prabhupada and, and so on. So, yeah, is it your nature? Do you have those abilities? Do you have a serious way to use it for Krishna? So, I think that's it. One more. Especially in times of the coronavirus, well, uh, wouldn't it be recommended to cultivate friendship with the worldwide Bhakti Yoga family across all artificial borders? Yeah, we should definitely cross artificial borders. We should not cross uh, necessary borders. For, I mean, and of course, we should cultivate friendship. We're not against other Bhakti Yoga groups. But some Bhakti Yoga groups, for example, I know one group that claims to be a Bhakti Yoga group. It's not ISKCON. It's not even Gaudiya Math. And they teach that all the Acharyas, beginning with Bhakti Vinod Thakur, uh, deviated from uh, Jiva Goswami. Of course, it's a stupid claim uh, coming from foolish people. But... They teach that, and, and I've seen, you know, some ISKCON devotees, including, you know, one or two of my own disciples, uh, come under that uh, whammy and, you know, come under that false idea and, and therefore give up not only ISKCON, but just give up Gaudiya Vaishnavism since Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So should we cultivate friendship with them? Uh, that's a good question maybe in a way that doesn't involve taking poison. So, you know, they say good fences make good neighbors. So, yes, we should cultivate friendship with everyone, but we should do it in a way that doesn't uh, cause 
serious negative consequences. And uh, so if we if that can be done, if we can cultivate friendship with worldwide bhakti yoga family in ways that do not uh, damage our own understanding, do not in any way affect our commitment to Prabhupada and his mission, his gone, which Prabhupada wanted us to serve, then yeah, it's a great idea. So uh, I guess we'll stop here. I'd like to, again, thank everyone for uh, tuning in. I hope everyone is staying safe and everyone is well. And I uh, appreciate your taking your time to uh, to watch. I hope, hope we'll see you again, at least in the list, uh, next Sunday. All right, Krishna.